This panel is about disruptive elements in infrastructure for IoT. I'll spend a few minutes just providing some background. We'll let the folks talk about um, each of the uh, panelists. We'll talk about their background and where they are. We have a great panel, by the way, uh, very diverse in terms of technology area and, uh, and how they approach the market. And we actually have a, a customer uh, potentially in the, at the panel. So uh, just a little bit about uh, American Tower. So I'm the CTO of American Tower. I've been there about 18 months. Uh, my role is really about global infrastructure, looking at innovations around that. Uh, the way I look at IoT in a, in a simple sense is, you know, there's different ways in which these networks can come together. There's licensed uh, networks, there's unlicensed networks, there's public networks, there's private networks, there's indoor networks, there's outdoor networks. It's a fairly complicated set of technologies. And, you know, the way American Tower is looking at it is, you know, we want to be a neutral host infrastructure supplier to develop those uh, assets that can support those types of solutions that run the gamut across all those. So some examples, by the way, uh, we have in Brazil, in our Brazilian market, we have stood up uh, LoRa networks. So LoRa is a low power WAN technology. Uh, we cover 35% now of the economic area. We have several hundred of these gateways. And it's available open public network that folks can connect to. Um, and uh, that's being rolled out across the country. Another example is uh, in the sort of private LTE network space and also in building systems. We, we do a lot of work in smart buildings around the world. We have going from DAS systems with distributed antennas into areas where we deploy small cells and Wi-Fi access points to support IoT. And then finally, we also, you know, given our portfolio of tower infrastructure around the world, we have over 171,000 uh, sites, macro tower sites, are running across 17 countries. And in those markets, there's a lot of operators, our MNO uh, partners that, uh, that rent space on those towers. We'll deploy things like licensed networks for IoT, like narrowband IoT and CAD-M and the various uh, subsequent generations into 5G. So what I wanted to do is, is let the panelists introduce themselves. We'll circle back, have some Q&A on, on the technology areas and, and the different assets that will make up infrastructure. By the way, you know, some of the stats, too, in terms of where things are going, there's a lot of interest in smart city, obviously. Uh, there's sustainability goals that we're very focused on as a, as a global uh, technology company. Uh, those require a lot of innovation in, in smart cities to support uh, traffic uh, management and quality of life, healthcare. Uh, we also look at the fact that by 2050, like 70% of the world's population will be in cities. So there's a lot of emphasis on how do we take what we're learning in buildings, at smart buildings, and also apply it at, at, the, at the city level, municipal level, and hopefully, as a global community, we can get smarter and more efficient in the use of energy. With that, I'll turn it over to David. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad uh, that you could join us this morning. Uh, my name is David Eltris. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the City of Boston. Uh, Martin Walsh appointed me in November of 2018. I came up from Washington, D.C., where I was the CIO for the District of Columbia. Um, I'm excited to be here and talk about, uh, and that was a very good segue, about the population migrating to cities. These are the things that we are looking at as we are looking at deploying small cell, as we are negotiating with our providers and what our 5G landscape will look like as we continue to lay down fiber throughout the city of Boston. But more importantly, looking at smart city technologies, at the end of the day, these are cities for people, not for technology. So it's really about driving, looking at our rising tides, looking at the change of the climate and how that's going to impact us. Now that Boston has uh, taken the top spot from my old city as the worst traffic uh, from DC, how do we make our streets safer and smarter as uh, Mayor Walsh is really looking to get down to a, a zero fatality on our streets? Um, as you may have heard that he's looking at lowering the, the, the speed limit within the city of Boston, as he's looking at public transportation and getting people out of their cars and, and using more public transportation. These are the challenges that we are dealing with now. Um, but also a lot of technology that is coming in the streets as well as we are hooking up our signals with uh, IoT technology, as we are putting water sensors to protect our shorelines with IoT technology. Um, but the one thing that we do look at, because we're the only one up here in the public sector, is we have a lot of citizen data. And with IoT, we really look at the security landscape as the, the surface area on the landscape for our core infrastructure is now grown exponentially with, with IoT. 
Um, so these are the things that we are looking at and being very mindful at how we deploy IoT throughout the city of Boston. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm a fellow at Verizon, responsible for network strategy and engineering. Um, the, in the past years, we launched our LTE uh, 10 years ago, which we have a pretty reliable coverage of LTE. Rely on that LTE coverage, we launched CAD-M for the IoT three years ago, and the CAD-M globally as the first operator two years ago. And we are in the middle of uh, rolling out 5G and the Narvan IoT as we're speaking. So overall, um, uh, our goal is make our system reliable, depending on, dependable by the public and also enterprise, all, all kind of sector, and uh, use our rich spectrum to serve the people, to enable human beings to do more things uh, in the future. And I'm certainly very excited to be here. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dave Wright. Uh, I am Director of Regulatory Affairs and Network Standards at uh, Ruckus Networks. And I'm also the president of the CBRS Alliance, which, uh, which I hope we'll spend some time talking about. Um, thanks to Ed and American Tower and the Enterprise Forum for the opportunity to participate. Um, I wanted to loop back to Mark's, I think, opening where he talked about, or he had a sort of sundial diagram with the various IoT sort of sectors, I guess you would say. And I think he sort of summarized it as enterprise and consumer. And in my mind, I thought that was a very comprehensive uh, slide, but I think I would include industrial maybe as a third sector, third broad category. Um, and it's amazing to me just to see how, uh, how fragmented each of those are, right? So consumer could be wearables, it could be residential. Enterprise is everything from hospitality to healthcare to carpeted office space, smart building, et cetera. And then industrial is a whole other sort of thing. You've got mining, and I think we have some sensors out here that um, monitor uh, oil wells. Uh, you've got mining, oil production, oil generation, oil distrib or energy distribution, pardon me, uh, transportation logistics, um, smart manufacturing, and then precision agriculture maybe fits under industrial. I'm not really sure, but that's a whole other category. Um, so there's all these different sort of subsections of IoT, and I think Ed made a good point in his introduction that there's really a range of solutions for those now. So we have short range, long range, licensed, unlicensed, and new shared, which we'll talk about. Um, but then, you know, getting into technologies, you have the, uh, the cellular uh, family of technologies, whether that's straight 3G, LTE, CAD-M, NB-IoT, 5G. Um, then we have just plain old vanilla Wi-Fi that's carrying a lot of the, uh, the IoT traffic, especially on the consumer side, I would say. And, uh, and then other unlicensed technologies, Zigbee, LoRa, um, uh, BLE, et cetera. So there's really a range of, uh, of solutions for those. Excited to talk about it. Um, I do think that one of the other real key aspects is, you know, who's deploying the network, who's managing it, who's uh, eating the, uh, the CapEx and the OpEx, um, you know, on the network to support IoT. That's a good segue. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I have an idea. Okay. So my name is Patrick Perotti. I recently joined a division at PwC called Connected Solutions. How many of you have heard of PwC? Probably everybody, right? That's wild. It's the first time I can say that in a public forum. <laughs> um, it, it, PwC uh, you know, has been a big tax and audit firm, uh, one of the top four in the world. Uh, I'm part of a team that's part of the advisory group that is actually looking to solve our clients' problems through the deployment of technology man through a managed service. It's the first time that PwC is involved in that, which is why I've joined. I have a sandbox. I'm in Washington, DC, where I bring together all the different types of technologies that Dave just mentioned. Uh, we're in a, we don't have a horse in, in the race. We're in a neutral position. We're what we call technology advantaged. We go to our clients, the Fortune 100. We say, what's your problem? And how are these technologies going to support them? Uh, the technologies that we're working on are in three different areas. One is, is clearly IoT and sensors, uh, looking at, at how the data that's being associated to these 
devices can be used to increase efficiencies or, or potentially protect employees. We're also doing remote sensing, and then the last thing that we're also involved with in my sandbox is facial recognition and object recognition. The idea that we're seeing happen around the world as it relates to wireless networks, and I've actually worked with Ed many years ago, we've been at this industry quite a long time, uh, is the evolution of how the wireless industry has gone. And we've seen a, a shift more recently from you know, connecting people to connecting things. And things have a completely different way of interacting with the world around them. First of all, we're lighting them up. One of the things that we like to talk about in my sandbox is making dumb things smart. We're essentially enabling things to be tracked, things to be located, things to be identified. And through that, providing a mechanism of essentially auditing the physical world. Uh, and so we've done that with partners. We're, we're not, so we're, you know, we'd be happy to work with everybody that's part of this panel, in particular the gentleman from the city, um, because we believe that uh, PwC is here to solve very difficult world problems. Uh, we have a, a very trusted brand. We actually sit, my team actually sits within risk and reg within PwC. We actually have uh, the, chief, the former chief privacy officer of the Justice Department that sits alongside us, so that everything that we do, we focus on how the data can be used, how can it be reliable, how can it be scalable, uh, and how can it be affordable when it comes to uh, delivering these solutions. We focus on indoor geolocation as well, uh, and we can also talk about that. And, and we're happy to work with any, any networking, any bearer uh, that can enable our uh, customers to solve their problems, giving them one, one throat to choke. So, <laughs> fine. so what I wanted to do before we get into a lot of dynamic uh, interaction, and then obviously we'll take questions from the audience, is uh, ask the panelists two questions to sort of all answer, um, and just take their, their shot at that. So one of them is, you know, what do you see is like, it's all about use cases. So what do you see as the pain point or the hot button in terms of use cases as you look at your business and, and what's happening today? that really will, will drive adoption, uh, given all the fragmentation and choice that's there. And then the other question you'd, I'd like you to answer is, like, from a, um, I guess a challenging standpoint, what's, what's really the limiting factor in deploying and moving faster? Is it, is it business models? Is it cost of the technology? Is it you know, the regulatory environment? Is it policy issues, funding? You know, what, are, what, are some of the, what are the challenges that prohibit that ideal use case from getting to market? Yeah. Um, I'll start with the last one first. I would probably say the, the biggest challenge um, when you're in the public sector like the city of Boston is a lot of regulatory and a lot of policies um, as we focus on you know, privacy concerns and, and security, but also funding is, is you know, you know, at, at the front of that <laughs> as well. Um, as, as we're looking at many other initiatives as well as IoT, you know, digital transformation and dealing with our infrastructure, you know, debt, um, as, we, as we look to scale the next generation of infrastructure. Um, but also as, as we look at IoT and kind of fold in a comprehensive strategy, um, really looking at what those networks need to look like to pass that much data, cons you know, con consistently all the time, uh, and the storage to, 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 to store and keep all that data. Um, so really, those are those are the biggest challenges. On the on the use case side, um, it's really about having because there's a lot of intersections with you know when you're in the public sector, especially when you're talking about smart city. There's someone called the chief of streets, and then there's you know and he's in charge of everything that happens on streets. So you know when we're talking about street lights, when we're talking about you know smart you know street sweepers with sensors on them. This is, this is all him. So there's a lot of collaboration, but uh, you know, really the intersection between the, the IT professionals and the OT professionals and really driving that together, it's really coming together as a team, getting a comprehensive strategy on smart cities and where we'd like to start, where the best bang for the buck, as it were, is, is, is gonna drive the, the next step of where we're looking to go. And as we're spending taxpayer dollars, that initiative is very, you know, it, how you communicate that is very important. I mean, as you know, we testify in front of our council what our budgets are, our, our budgets are all public, so where we spend our dollars is, is very important, and all of Bostonians know where we spend it. Great, thanks. Uh, on the IoT front, uh, we have been uh, driving the user cases and try to bring the traffic um, up. On our LTE now, IoT now work. 
if you look at the smart, smart phone service, which has been growing pretty rapidly in the past years, the IoT service, we have seen double digit growth. And uh, I think that's one of the part we would like to encourage user cases, you know, particularly from any innovative service to be able to bring to our network and uh, to boost in the revenue on this kind of a wide area, IoT network. Uh, versus I notice, you know, there are lots of innovation going on, use Wi-Fi and use some private network like Nora, Sigfox. I think the I think one thing I would like to say is the technology is here, the network is here, and nationwide. Right. We really encourage all the user cases we can work together and make this IoT works for everyone, really enrich people's life. I think that's one of the messages I certainly want to uh, advertise further. You don't have to wait for 5G is what you're saying. We don't need to wait for 5G. <laughs> right. Actually, yeah. as a matter of fact, you know, if you look at IoT technology, the massive 5G IoT is CADM and narrowband IoT. So really, we should just uh, you know, make use of that technology now, which is available nationwide. From the network side, the challenge actually is how we reduce the latency to, pro to provide a network for critical IoT, industrial <coughs> IoT for the next phases, which going down to less than 10 millisecond kind of end-to-end -end latency. That's one of the biggest challenge technologies as we are facing five years down the road. We would like to make this technology not just you know, massive IoT for long latency kind of system, but also for short latency, high reliable kind of system. I think that's what we're working very hard on with the city of Boston to have dark, uh, dark fiber night out to provide a transport layer and as well as a network bring the multi-access age computing to the system for the security to make sure this system not only built for now, but also built for future. So I would defer to Dave on on what the uh, you know what what the uh, sort of use cases for the cities are. But you know, I, I, that said, um, from the interactions that we've had with the various uh, cities on their smart city initiatives, I think some of the most compelling ones are are around operational efficiencies for the city. Um, so hopefully, I'm not too far off base there. Uh, we hear from them that if they can deploy networks that allow them to be much more efficient in traffic handling, in garbage collection, in um, just you know, uh, actually even also defragmenting the the various networks that have been deployed. I don't know what the situation is in Boston, but there's another. Very large city on the eastern seaboard, uh, which has a, a lot of very fragmented um, networks at the departmental level within the city. And so they are looking to deploy um, you know, a, a single solution that would allow all the networks to, to essentially uh, utilize a single infrastructure and not have you know, 10 or 15 different networks that they're trying to manage and, uh, and then federate um, uh, suboptimally, I think I would term it. So I think those are some of the most compelling use cases that I have seen, and a lot of it again comes back to efficiency, which I think then kind of goes back to your point about funding as well as sustainability, uh, financial sustainability, Dave. Um, in terms of challenges, the challenges that we have seen with some of our municipal uh, wireless deployments, uh, they've been a lot around site acquisition, um, so getting, uh, getting assets or getting, uh, pardon me, uh, access to the assets where we can mount our equipment to provide the signal where it needs to be, um, making sure that there's power and backhaul at those locations. Uh, aesthetics becomes actually quite a big issue, and um, I don't know if any of you know Mark, Michael Marcus, but he's a former FCC commissioner. He's quite active on Twitter if you want to follow him, and, uh, and he likes to harp on, um, I'm sorry, sorry, Jen, but he likes to harp on the carriers about you know, making sure that their small cell deployments are tidy and, and, and attractive. And so, I mean, we've done um, smart city. Help with that. Yeah, thank you. Oh, well, I was just going to say, we've done smart city deployments. Wasn't with, a setup, though. Yeah, but, uh, but thank you. Uh, yeah. So we've done some smart city deployments, including with American Tower uh, here, where we've had to um, do some innovative things to make uh, to make sure that the residents were happy with how things looked in ter terms. In part, me including putting small cells in uh, in fake flower pots. Um, uh, over in the city of Westminster in London, we've, uh, we've painted our small cells with non-RF or RF transparent paint uh, to make sure they blend into the surrounding buildings. And, you know, these are, these are the kinds of things that you end up dealing with. Um, so, yeah, those are a few of the challenges. Yeah. We actually built 500 uh, small cells in the city of San Francisco 
working closely with San Francisco. So if you go to San Francisco, you will hardly notice the sell side. But you know, um, during the Super Bowl, uh, I think a few years ago, which is a pretty successful story. Yeah. Patrick? So our, our, our use cases are based on our client. We're not technologists, right? We, we orchestrate technologies, um, including LP WAN and Sigfox, who I think is in the room, and other, other technologies to, to deliver on our clients' needs. Uh, and so we, we actually do the reverse of what a lot of engineering-focused or product-focused technology companies do, which is they design and they, they build and they sell. We do the opposite. We, we sell, we design, and we build, knowing that we already have uh, the technology available in our sandbox and it's been t tested and proven and then we deploy it. Um, a, a use case and an example, uh, we were with a l large uh, hospitality firm. Uh, we were talking about deploying these types of networks in their environments and talking about utility and, and, and cost savings and potentially using facial recognition for, for guest entry, et cetera, et cetera. And they say, well, what we really need, and this was because of a, of a, of a regulatory directive in certain cities that have ordinances, and I think Boston's one of them, where where every single housekeeper needs to have uh, a button that allows them to notify in case they uh, ha have an emergency. Uh, and if any of you have ever worked in, in the wireless industry and understand that trying to locate something um, indoors is very complicated, uh, and we brought together different components to this technology and we developed essentially uh, a button, and it's a very uh, dumb button, but it does one thing, and it does one thing very well. When you press it, it'll tell the security in a given uh, hotel exactly where that button is being pressed and can send support. Uh, so we've developed some of the use cases, used some of the technologies that were mentioned here, and then solve that problem for the client. Now, once we've deployed that infrastructure, uh, the great thing is, is you can add on and bolt on additional applications. If you can track luggage carts and breakfast trays and you know, cots, the, the, the applications become uh, immense. And I think the key thing uh, that Jin mentioned is the fact that the technology is here today. And if you're uh, thinking about solving a problem with IoT, you got to just do it because the technology is available to do it. It's, you can do it efficiently in a scalable way uh, and, and in a cost-effective way with uh, off-the-shelf technologies. The key thing is how you, how you integrate them together and how you solve the client's problem. Once you've done that, then all of a sudden the floodgates open and, and the relationship between a city and say all the, all the hotel properties is something that should be looked at and integrated as well. So there's no reason to- Emergency services. For all kinds of services, starting with that, such that you don't have to, you can leverage each other's infrastructure uh, to provide uh, additional support and, and, and services. Great, so, so now we can dive into some more interactions. So what I think most folks, how many folks have ever heard of CBRS? in the room? There's a few. Some I know, so you know. <laughs> But um, I really want, Dave, if you could spend a few minutes talking about it. So when you look at the panel and say, OK, here's someone who's a real user of technology, really needs to transform an infrastructure environment uh, uh, you know, in, say, the city of Boston, and that's happening in cities around the world, there's three different flavors in which you go to market. So Patrick was talking about this help button. That was done with unlicensed technology, Sigfox uh, as a gateway, and, and, and you could extend that to a community. So a bunch of other stuff that we can't really talk about. How, how, we, how, we, log, how we triangulate inside of Right, but, but the thing is, yeah. that's just saying I take unlicensed spectrum and I apply it. Wi-Fi is similar. Right. Um, and then Jin mentioned about all of those small cell deployments, the infrastructures nationwide. We have licensed IoT devices from an operator like Verizon all being put in place and being sold and managed by, uh, by the network where you could trust and deal with some of the security. Um, and then we have this new space that's been created primarily here in the US, but it's now you know, on the roadshow trying to figure out how other countries around the world, and it's called CBRS, and it's like a shared spectrum where multiple players share, and there's a way in which that mechanism works. So I'll let Dave explain it in, in, in some detail, stuff. keeping it at a high yeah. level. But what it does open up, it opens up the opportunity for these hybrid networks. So you could look at, public networks, licensed spectrum, but then you can complement that with, with these uh, private networks or private LT networks, which use this separate spectrum band. And then you could also use unlicensed technologies as part of that solution set. So maybe you could, you could explain how that all has come together and as leader of the uh, CBRS Alliance, uh, how that's uh, growing around the world. Great, thanks, Ed. Happy to. Um, so you know, as Ed said, I think up till now, we've largely sort of had a bipolar situation where, you know, not only within the IoT realm, but just within the overall wireless communications realm, 
you really had unlicensed technologies, sort of Wild West, open to everybody, huge ecosystem, and then you've had you know, licensed cellular systems, and, and it's been a relatively you know, small group of players at a national level, or pardon me, global level. Um, you know, and, uh, and what CBRS is doing is it's kind of you know, blurring the lines there a little bit. So uh, this all came about in 2012. Um, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology came out with a report that said, you know, we're, not, we're gonna run out of spectrum. We're especially gonna run out of spectrum below 10 gigahertz if we don't start approaching how we make spectrum available differently. And they recommended a sharing approach where uh, the federal uh, government uh, actually holds the majority of spectrum below 10 gigahertz in this country. And they said, uh, federal agencies, you need to go take a close look at what you've got and figure out some bands where you can share it with commercial users. Um, that led to the uh, NTIA um, coming back with a recommendation saying, there's this great mid-band spectrum in the 3.5 gigahertz range that, uh, that the Navy has, um, but they use it lightly. Um, it's mostly uh, naval radar systems, actually. Uh, and we think that we could share this with the commercial uh, entities. So all of that led to the NTIA and FCC working together, and they came out with um, uh, a ruling back in 2015. Uh, that was the initial ruling. It's been refined over the last three or four years, and you know we're on, I'll just say right now we're on the verge of commercial service in this band. We think that'll happen uh, in late Q2 of this year. And you know, to keep it at a high level, which is going to be fun, um, as Ed said, uh, it's a three-tier sharing framework. So if you picture this as a pyramid, at the top of the pyramid you have the incumbent services. So that's where these naval radar systems are. There's a few commercial incumbents as well. There's some fixed satellite earth stations, and then there are also some grandfather fixed wireless uh, broadband services there. And if I haven't said it, it's 3550 to 3700 megahertz. So it's 150 megahertz of prime mid-band spectrum uh, that's being opened up. So we have these incumbents, and the whole principle is that we're gonna use a geolocation database, so sort of cloud database coordination uh, for access to the spectrum. So these are what we're calling spectrum access systems, or SASs, uh, and um, to operate at the new tiers, and I'll briefly describe the new tiers, you've got uh, what's called the priority access license tier, which is tier two, and that is analogous to licensed spectrum, so that's sort of you know, representing maybe the side of the world, and um, those are licenses to operate exclusively in a 10 megahertz channel at the county level. Um, so you get a license for a 10 megahertz assignment uh, for a specific county in the U.S., and there's about 3,000 counties. Um, and uh, what's interesting about this is you're not getting a license to operate in a specific frequency range, so it's not like you're being assigned 3560 to 3570, which is sort of how we've done traditional spectrum licenses. This is to 10 megahertz. So today you could be operating in 3560 to 3570. Tomorrow you could be operating in 30, you know, 580 to 3590. Um, and the reason for that is those incumbent services have the right to preempt you. Um, you'll always, as a PAL holder at tier two, you'll always have an exclusive right, but it's not to a specific frequency range. And that's why there has to be frequency, frequency agility on all of the equipment uh, that operates in this band. Um, so PAL tier, um, up to seven PALs can be assigned in any county. So up to 70 megahertz of the 150 can be assigned at PAL. And then the tier three is called general authorized access, and I probably should have brought a slide, I apologize for that. Um, you can go to cbrsalliance.org, by the way, and all this is up there. But uh, the third tier is GAA, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. Anything that's not being used by an incumbent or not being used by a priority access licensee is available for general authorized use. And um, it's, some people make the analogy to unlicensed. It's a bit imprecise but it is permissive or opportunistic access, and that's the important part. And um, the reason it's not really unlicensed is because you have to work with a SAS. Um, nobody operates in this band uh, at tier two or tier three unless they're uh, being coordinated actively by a SAS. That's how we make sure the Navy is comfortable that we're gonna protect their operations. And, um, and you also have to agree to this preemptibility. So tier three is always preemptible by both tier two and tier one. Um, 
But uh, this frequency range has is, is globally uh, been available for some time as TDD LTE uh, spectrum. So there is a, a very large and well-established ecosystem of equipment uh, uh, that operates in this band, uh, both infrastructure side and client side. So we're leveraging all of that. And because we're now sort of opening up the, um, the access here, uh, what it's done is it's resulted in just a, a huge amount of interest. So, you know, the five sort of primary use cases around this would be mobile operators looking at using this for urban, suburban yep. capacity densification. Uh, you have the cable operators looking at utilizing this to roll out their own uh, cellular footprint for their mobile uh, broadband plans for their subscribers and, again, sort of the urban, suburban areas where they, uh, they have their hybrid fiber coax networks. Um, fixed wireless access, so I mentioned that there's actually some uh, grandfathered fixed wireless in the upper 50 megahertz of the band. They're very <laughs> excited about the opportunity to utilize wider channels, you know, now 150 megahertz of spectrum. Um, also get the economics that come along with LTE, much, much larger, uh, uh, you know, equipment ecosystem than they have today. Um, so those are the three kind of operator models, and then more kind of probably pertinent to this conversation, you've got um, private services, so private LTE and then 5G. So we do have uh, work going on within the alliance um, around 5G now. But um, private would be everything from enterprise to industrial, sort of internal communications needs, all the IoT things that we're talking about. And then um, the fifth one, the final one, is really uh, what we call in-building cellular. So uh, the ability for an enterprise or a public venue, stadium, hotel, uh, to roll out a footprint, and they could use it for private LTE uh, internal comms, but then they could also open it up to the subscribers of the, uh, the mobile operators for better in-building coverage. And we think this is going to be key for realizing the vision around 5G where we're going to have these very ubiquitous, dense um, uh, small cell networks because frankly, you know, no industry can do that on its own, uh, can build that out on its own. I think the CapEx is yep, yep. calculated like a trillion dollars. So we're gonna have to spread that over a much broader group of players, and that's what we're doing with CBRS. Um, uh, I think it was Mark said he was happy to have a logo slide earlier. Um, our logo slide for the Alliance is crazy. I need a bigger slide because we now have 117 members includes all the tier one mobile operators, you know, the big cable operators, the um, neutral host tower companies, uh, enterprise, you know, traditionally enterprise vendors, cellular infrastructure vendors, universities, hospitals, uh, hoteliers, property management companies, um, fixed wireless access folks. So uh, it really reflects the range of opportunity. Sorry, I tried to be quick, but. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, is a, it is a complex topic, but it is disruptive. And I think when we talk about the theme of the conference, that spectrum band now offers opportunity. For, like a the in theory, you could go to Best Buy, pick up a small cell LTE base station and put it somewhere and have it you know, sort of uh, connected back to the SAS controller. And it'll give it a channel and those 80 megahertz of unlicensed and you can have your own private network. Um, so that's what we're looking at as American Tower is neutral host systems in building trying to deal with the fact that in the current model, you have to deal with in-building systems by putting all the operators there, or you now you can put one network there and all the operators' devices can share it. And it's a much more efficient deployment model and it opens up many more buildings around the cities or in different parts of public venues, such as even the campus here to support that. So in, in some sense, I'd ask the question back to maybe David and, and to Jin, how do you see, you know, when you look at CBRS, I don't know how much you've, um, other than maybe the introduction here, but if you could stand up a private network to do mission critical applications, and you could, uh, there's ways to do it uh, where you get the license, you have some priority rights, but there's other ways where you can look at that network as something you can do on your own for certain services. Is that something of interest to the city of Boston? And ultimately, too, how would Verizon look at taking advantage of that spectrum when you have a large amount of, of license spectrum. Those are questions for both, both you guys as you look at, the, at this new technology as being disruptive. Um, I mean, for, for the city of Boston, I, I definitely could, could align this to some use cases around the Office of Emergency Management and you know, very close networks and also the Boston Police Department and, and whatnot that really want to have very close networks within communicating with EMS and the fire department. So, I mean, I can see... Uh, you know, some use cases aligning to that. Um, but, I mean, it's, it, it, it's all a question of, of taking that to the, to the next step, finding out where the alignment of the use cases are, and, you know, as I started off talking, um, where we can put those dollars, where we can align that budget. Um, 
and, and taking that to the next step for, for a lot of the, the agencies across the city. Um, but I definitely could see their you know, alignment of some use cases in that kind of private spectrum. You, are you guys seeing any, any of the use of CBRS in a, in a municipality on a private basis? Are you, are you starting to see that in the US? Yes. And Jin, are you, seeing, are you seeing that? Or how do you see the spectrum and how do you take advantage of it at Verizon? Um, at Verizon, um, both uh, CBR, we are very active in this VSMIS. Yes, you have been very active. And uh, I think the shared spectrum certainly that. is one of the complementary spectrum for the nice spectrum. Mm. And uh, as, as you know, sp spectrum is like real estate. You never have enough. <laughs> so, so for us, we use a complementary uh, CBI spectrum as well as analysis spectrum in both LTE as well as eventually in the 5G technology to, to, to support, you know, for example, when we talk about gigabits per second in the LTE world, you have to use some kind of a shared spectrum, CBI spectrum as well as analysis spectrum. So for us, we treat both as a complementary type of service. But on top of that, with the nice spectrum as the control channel as well as also as, a, as insurance, guarantee um, for the reliability. So that's how we can achieve mission critical type of application or some of the guaranteed service. So for us, you know, the control channel is always on the license channel, but the data channel, we, all, we actively utilize a shared spectrum as well as unlicensed spectrum. We push very hard. If you look at the LTE unlicensed band, as well as the 5G, and NRU, we all play a very active role to make sure the standard can take care of those spectrum as well, yeah. And for those of you who aren't familiar, if you, if you look at, uh, just do some research into LTE LAA, so I mean, that's the technology that's been available for a few years now in the US to augment, you know, for a, a mobile operator, they can now add five gigahertz unlicensed capacity to the license band as Jin just described. Um, and so, yeah, that's... Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that was a long battle between various industries, too, yes. in well, terms of using yeah. that spectrum. It all worked out well. Yeah. So, so let, me, let me circle back and say, okay, you know, I don't, we have about, um, I'd say, another 10 minutes before we open up for questions. But so some more um, opportunities here, too. So back to, so if, you, if each one of you three can pitch David on what is it that you see, you know, if you were, let's say, in, the, in a city position, what's the sort of belief system you have on current <clears throat> knowledge base of requirements or things that you would say are the most important. Like one of the areas in this city is traffic. Sure. So if you can go there, that's fine. But you know, being able to put roadside units, looking at CV to X, looking at autonomous vehicles, how does a smart city infrastructure deal with you know, the types of things you want to do to make uh, transportation more efficient, whether it's public transportation or private transportation? That as a sort of backdrop, you know, what, what, would you, what do you see as sort of a pitch to Dave here on, on the uh, <clears throat> so I, I would yeah that. I mean I would I would go back to our tagline about making dumb things smart. Um, so if you think about what we're doing with the scooters and the ride shares and the bikes and, and all these cities, I mean in DC I think there's five different companies right now that are deploying these scooters and they're everywhere. I mean they're like they're like trash. I mean they're they're horrible. You could you, you fall, you can step on them. I mean they're they're just literally everywhere. Just the ability to to be able to know where they are and know what how much battery is left in them. Just, just developing that technology, I mean, it's off the shelf technology that can do that today, whether it's NB-IoT, whether you use you know, a company like Pulte to do location using LTE networks. They're, they're, they're cheap and cheerful ways of, of deploying ways to track things in a city, in a building, and that should be the fundamental layer for the Don't the guys who build that, system. don't the folks who d deploy those yeah. uh, services, don't they track it themselves? Yeah, but the city should have that data. And, and the city should potentially. Is there firewall own. privacy issues? Other types. It's what's the city that's allowing them to have the 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 permits to be able to deploy their business? The city should be able to track every single one of those. Today, that data doesn't find its way back into. Uh, not that I know of. I mean, not, you're no longer in D.C., but <clears throat> that's that's what I live every day. I, you know, I walk in front of my office where my sandbox is, and I and trip I got over a scooter. Over all those They're all over. Yeah. And and so the, I mean, that's a very simple. Because, I mean, I guess the, the, the whole initiative is a really positive one, and it's about reducing traffic using these scooters, and, and the bike share business is, is huge in Washington. Yeah, and, but the problem is, is that the, the implementation has been an issue, and I think it comes down to, again, that fundamental base layer of building any type of IoT business, which is, you know, what is it and where is it? And, and just being able to deliver on that 
before we start talking about the latency issues, and you know, you're, not, you're never going to be streaming Netflix on one of these things, right? So it'd be very dangerous if you did. Um, so, so the ability to make, you know, to, to generate the ability to understand where something is in a very cost-effective way, uh, with the, with the long battery life, so you don't have to charge it to know where it is constantly. I think that's one of the fundamentals that we've been working on. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it's it's looking at the specific use case, whether it's safety, whether it's energy management. How would PWC, if you, if you're pitching? to the city of Boston, <clears throat> a particular use case, whether it maybe is DC, Boston is, yeah. in, is in, uh, cluttered with those. Like, what is it that you would deliver in terms of a solution? Is it the backend uh, solution in terms of data and analytics? Yeah. Is it the tracking so, solution? So the old PwC would have said, got his let's, wallet let's, out. Let's so. figure out, let's, do, let's put together a strategy and let's you know, figure out how we're gonna solve this problem, look at all the different technology. Right now, the new PwC, the one that I'm part of, is let's, let's go ahead and start tracking these things for you. Let's put, you know, uh, the right technology in, the cheapest, reliable, scalable technology that we can get out there, and let's start getting It'd the It would be data. like a super tracker across well, all right. these different and types Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, it's all about the data, right? We're, we're, these new networks can't be just about communicating or streaming video, right? right? They're yeah. about the data. And, and obviously, there's going to be some resilience. You can get resilience by, by putting multiple gateways or base stations in case one goes down. That's how you can build resilience. It doesn't have to be tied to the one pipe and the one connectivity, right? There's also a lot that's happening with mesh and shared, you know, shared spectrum is really the evolution of what we used to talk about with LTE Direct, right? And, and the notion that, you know, everybody can observe everybody else's signals. How do you create this signal graph of data that could be used uh, at the city level? So those are the things that PwC want to get involved in. And, and essentially, you know, proof is in the pudding. We would say this is the strategy, but we'll, all, we'll go ahead and, and implement it for you so that you can start seeing results right away. That's the pitch. So I don't know. We're ready to sign the contract right now. <laughs> Jim, let's switch. So how is Verizon pitching to the city of Boston? Uh, from an IoT perspective, your assets and how you would see the vision of a connected city. Um, I think we have already did a great yeah. picture. Right? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so, um, there are press announcements on? I think there were press announced a few years ago already. So it's, it's ongoing activity now, pretty much. We're building the fiber as part of one fiber city. We have the first city to be the one fiber city. We actually yes. provide a connection, a free connection. Uh, to the city uh, and the, some of the public facility, as well as the you know, access to some of the city utility and build the stock fiber, pretty much cable to cable everywhere kind of deal. So um, from my perspective, I certainly see more and more sensors can be put on the system and uh, yep. we can make the system really autonomous operation and uh, to be more intelligent. I think that's one of the mission we have is when we have so many access technology and there's so many users, we're talking about billions of uh, things, mm -hmm. we really want to make the system very intelligent. So through this processing, we can certainly working together to see what kind of uh, intelligence towards the latency, towards throughput, towards the you know, location. Or, so we can certainly connectively working together to make the system better and uh, more intelligent. Is Verizon just beyond the access network or the fiber transport, you know, let's assume you have sensors out there, are you also intending to do some of the back-end processing and analytics and, and deliver, let's say, a, an answer that says, if you correlate these, these parameters based on the, the wealth of data, that this is a good insight for, for cities or for other municipalities. Is that something Verizon sees as one of their service offerings? Yes, I think we actually would like to platform as a service, network as a service. I think that's some of the missions our, uh, our people has been working on, yeah, with, uh, with city of Boston and uh, for example. Dave, Wi-Fi, CBRS, what's the pitch? Is it technology or is it a use case? I would agree with Patrick. I mean, it's not about just connectivity, right? Connectivity is great, but you know, unless you're dealing with addressing a business challenge for the city, why does it matter? Um, so I th and, I, and I frankly think that applies really to just about all of those different uh, IoT subsectors that we talked about earlier, maybe not consumer, but everything on the enterprise and industrial side. And, and it's one of the huge challenges, frankly, um, is that, you know, uh, we're, we're going, when we talk about cellular technologies anyways, we're going away from really being a business to consumer solution now to business to business. And, and it's not a connectivity discussion any longer. It's not about you know, unlimited gigabytes per month. It's about how do you help me you know, with my operational efficiencies for my business. And it's a whole different sales uh, discussion. 
Um, so, you know, all that said, uh, you know, you have to have connectivity to have those conversations, first of all. So I think if I was chatting to David uh, specifically about, you know, transportation um, as an issue and, and how to address some of the questions, I mean, I think if you're working with a mobile operator partner who's got great coverage um, in your city, you know, certainly above ground, then, you know, hey, you're in good shape. Um, I would say, you know, maybe you have some underground parking garages where it's, it's for whatever reason, you're not getting a good signal from the macro. Okay. Hey, CBRS is a great way to, uh, to extend coverage. You could deploy it yourself. You could work with your uh, mobile partner to deploy it, and, uh, and it's a lower cost, and it's a way for you to then get pervasive uh, awareness of, you know, uh, which spots are being utilized and meld that into your overall transportation plan. I think, I think David needs to work with all three of us. Too. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So that's the whole solution, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Particularly if you look at the narrowband IoT, we, we talk about that. 20 dB. One third, one third to show. Yeah. Cutting a deal here. Four times, yeah. uh, <laughs> four times uh, coverage than what we have now. Certainly very suitable for underground parking now. Yeah. So on that, I, that thread, I would say, okay, so here is the, the challenge. This it comes back to the money, the business model, public and private partnerships. How do you get it done? What's, what's your, and I'll start, David, with you. It's like, okay, so what's the best way to sort of bring things to market uh, from your experience, both in DC and now in Boston? How, how, what's, is there a new model, business model, or an approach where the public sector and the private sector to build these networks requires funding? The private sector has money, but just getting through the process and understanding the business model is always a challenge. So can you folks sort of talk through that? As you're, as you're starting to pitch these things and see how they come to market. So th that, is, that is a, I mean, in, in Boston's a great city, you know, to, to have those conversations, really the, the partnership between public and private sector um, and, and looking to make a difference within not only for the city of Boston, but also a lot of their employees and those companies are in the city of Boston. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of incentive there. Um, the, the challenge of bringing, bringing them into the, 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 bringing them to the table in creating a, a, a lab or an innovation center to really one of the things that we started to do with uh, in, in DC just when I left was a uh, 5G innovation center uh, for emergency responders uh, that, we, that we were doing in DC. But you know we, and actually the first group of cohort is about to, about to go through there now. Um, looking at uh, you know different companies, the external awareness for firefighters when they're in fires and and whatnot. So it's an opportunity for a lot of a lot of players to come to the table and 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 come together in an innovation center and talk about what's the the, the next step uh, uh, for for the city. One of the things when I first got to Boston was try to bring something similar here okay. uh, to to try to create a, a a lab or an innovation center to bring private enterprise to the table uh, in, in, in a cohort to address some of the challenges that we're having, bringing you know, different parts of, you know, from, from the schools to the fire, to the police department, to emergency management, to the table as well, and, and address some of the things that we think could be the most impactful uh, at the end of the day for, for our citizens. So the, that's, that's always the main driver, especially when we're for a public official. When those connections get made, then you can see the value. Then you say funding will follow, and the the relative relation, relationship between the private sector and public sector is it just transactional at that point, or does it get to be somehow funded in some creative ways? It's more. It's more. I mean, in my experience, it's more transactional. Okay. All right. So we have a few minutes left before Q and A. Anybody else with a thought on you know uh, the concept of public-private partnerships and how uh, these will provide value in terms of go to market and getting some of this infrastructure built? Any thoughts? Patrick? Uh, I'll go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, got it. Sure. I, I, sorry, I don't want to talk too much, but um, I'll say from, from our experiences, mostly on the Wi-Fi side, uh, and, and, and this is a little bit of a shift away from IoT and more towards sort of public access. Um, you've had a lot of municipal you know, uh, Wi-Fi projects over the last, call it four or five years, sort of, uh, Muni Wi-Fi 2.0, uh, we did the big reset after the, the, the not so great rollouts back in the mid 2000s um, before the mobile world uh, evolved. But um, what we have seen is, yeah, private uh, public partnerships have definitely been, uh, you know, one of the more sustainable models, um, I would say. 
So Ruckus is uh, you know, honored to be a part of the uh, group that deployed uh, public Wi-Fi across the different boroughs in New York City. Um, there was a public-private partnership intersection, which is Qualcomm, Google, a bunch of other companies um, came together and, you know, has put Wi-Fi into these advertising kiosks, you know, um, uh, all around the five boroughs now. Uh, I think there's somewhere north of 3,000 of those deployed. And those are largely uh, for public access, you know, for, for you know, just citizens and guests uh, to, to have uh, Wi-Fi connectivity around the streets of New York. Um, but, you know, the city can certainly leverage those. I mean, that's part of the, the agreement that was worked into this. So, um, you know, they're looking at CBRS uh, certainly for, you know, as an access technology. So there's a whole range of, uh, of smartphones that are now coming out with the CBRS um, band. So eventually they'd be able to use those for departmental communications, police, fire, et cetera. Um, and potentially in the future even for, uh, you know, for public access uh, over an LTE bearer as well as the public Wi-Fi that they have today. But there's nothing to prohibit the city from using those same locations for their IoT communications needs as well. Uh, we've got a similar model in Europe with JC Dassault uh, utilizing their street furniture, Paris, other cities, um, and then working with you know, Philips GE on smart lighting, um, lots of, uh, of LED refreshes going on. Uh, around the world, so a lot of people are embedding, um, you know, small cells into those street uh, street lamps. Um, Big Belly, which is a, a you know a garbage recycling uh, thing, they now have you know Wi-Fi access points embedded in in those garbage collection units. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that private-public partnerships is going to be very key to this. I think, again, it's probably a little bit more clear to me uh, how that applies on when you're trying to roll out or you're addressing the access issue and providing access. But then again, that's easily leveraged for IoT as well. I think it was the point Patrick made earlier that we've got to use these networks for multiple things. They can't be siloed. Great. Thanks, David. So with that, we have about, uh, I don't know, five, ten minutes left. Some Q&A from the audience is always great. It's, I'll let you, the, the uh, moderators in the audience there hand out the mics. Usher. Good morning, and thank you for um, the interesting presentation. I don't know if there's a simple answer to this, but I'm just curious um, what implications you see of some of the direction that um, you've talked about here having on cybersecurity. Does it make it simpler, more complex, TBD? So, I mean, my simple answer is going to be more complex, right, because you're going to end up with multiple networks lots of data that now could be stored in a repository that could be public or private, and so that increases the attack service. Now, thinking about that up front, and there's a lot of technology and protocols, and I'll let some of you folks also talk to that, is you know, how would that um, be thought about up front, given the world we live in? And when everything is connected, people want to do bad things with those connected <coughs> objects, and we need to protect our citizens, and we need to protect you know, everybody from that um, at risk. So I don't know if there's anybody who has any specifics on cyber. How does Verizon take or look at cybersecurity risk with these new IoT? And, and I know that the protocols have a lot of robustness, but. Yeah. I, I think uh, Verizon, uh, the, one of the, when we look at the different IoT technology in like three, four years ago, we had cybersecurity as well as privacy and security it's in the general category is quite, quite important to us. I think that's one of the reasons we're starting developing the CADAM as well as Narapan IoT industry GPP form so we can have the same security, same type of security as your smartphone or more sophisticated devices. From that perspective, none of the IoT, techno uh, none of the te IoT technology we deploy um, has any less security than the smartphone the iPhone system you already have. So that's one thing. On top of that, we actually, as part of a multi-access edge computing, we also bring the security much, much closer to the edge, so which build additional component to the security. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think the, 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 you know, the digitization of the, of the physical world is gonna be causing many, many more problems that we've seen online. Um, I mean, of course, it's not good if your bank account gets siphoned. That's bad. But if a truck rams into a crowded folks because it's being remotely, uh, you know, uh, driven, then that's the, the the risks are much much higher. We see the you know what just happened uh, with these with these uh, these planes. It was tied to software, right? It's probably the first time in the history of the aviation industry where software was the cause 
of a major uh, airline incident. So clearly, uh, you know, whether it's at the regulation level, at the national level, but then also at the city level, uh, policing the Internet of Things is something that's going to become more and more important. Uh, I think that uh, whether it's licensed or unlicensed, it's irrelevant. The fact is, is we're all living in a, in a sort of a post-Snowden world where, you know, things, things are detected by other things, right? In this room, there's probably 150 Wi-Fi signals, people's Mac IDs from their Fitbits. It's all there. Uh, and the value that it brings to us as humans is well beyond kind of the risks that we've been talking to up until now. Uh, so I think o over time, um, you know, governments and, and policymakers need to, first, first of all, they need to understand the technology. The FTC uh, recently did uh, a study on this because of the, uh, the webcams that had been hacked. And, and you know, the, the bad thing there was it brought down the Internet. Well, we can still live, you know, without the Internet. We can still breathe air. We can still eat. We can still function. <laughs> Uh, some of the things that we're looking at with uh, the world of IoT are going to be potentially very harmful to, to p people's, you know, lives. And, and I think those, those things need to be addressed. And, and, you know, I think, you know, policymakers need to, need, to be, need to understand the technologies. And we need to put, whether it's through self-regulation or through imposed regulation, uh, systems in place to, to deal with this for sure. Thanks. So we've got to get a couple more questions. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you. Great panel. Uh, David, uh, I hope you're looking forward to lots of championships, because uh, Boston <laughs> will, yes. will certainly bring Very those to you. So. Uh, <laughs> Two-part question to you. One is, can you just highlight a couple of the big wins that you had in DC in terms of uh, the, the initiatives that you put in place from smart cities? Um, and then have you, uh, in the three months you've been here, put a strategy together for Boston uh, as a city, or does that already exist? So whatever, if you can comment on both those, I'd appreciate it. Um, so in terms of the initiatives that we have working towards Smart City, I mean, there are a lot of initiatives around autonomous vehicles that we're testing. We are, are looking also at a lot of uh, street lights, you know, which kind of, you know, came into, you know, your point, you know, if, if someone were to hack that and get into our, our, our street lights, these are the things that, that we take very seriously. Um, but we are really focused more on kind of really the street level um, as we talk about, uh, uh, you know, bad traffic in the city of Boston. The way that we approach this in terms of the, the, the areas that we kind of cherry pick and the areas that we want to start and the people that we want to partner with most is the areas that are going to impact Bostonians most. Um, so obviously, it's we're, we're looking to create you know smarter buildings and, like I said before, smarter streets and safer streets. And and Mayor Walsh has a lot of initiatives around around uh, um, creating a, you know zero fatality in, in in the years to come. But also, you know, looking at at pushing policies forward on lowering speed limits, making sure people are not texting when they're driving. So some of them are very um, not as technical as, as you know, this panel on kind of the infrastructure. Uh, the last meeting I was in with, with Mayor Walsh, and you know, he said that to first step of smart city technology is get people out of their cars and get them on the metro. Um, one of the initiatives he did was uh, put out uh, so that uh, students would have passes on, on the T, whether they're in public school or private school or whatnot so that they, you know, the, the kids can, you know, drive on, you know, take on the, the metro. So some of it is, is kind of, of basic. Um, I know that was a challenge that we also had in D.C., that, you know, with, with the relationship between the government and kind of the metro system, and our metro system in D.C. is also aging as well, and it's always kind of a big ticket item to repair those. Um, so these are the challenges that, that you guys have here at the T. Those are the challenges we have in D.C. So these are the challenges that, that we deal with when we're looking at you know the next version of smart city technology, I have a series of meetings throughout after our budget gets finalized in the next two months, as we testify before the D, the, uh, the Boston Council. Um, then we are looking to take our next round of smart city uh, uh, meetings to see kind of really what is next and how we're going to align the strategy. In terms of the strategy for Boston. Yes, I do, but I haven't gotten a chance to communicate it to the mayor yet, so he goes first. So <laughs> we'll find just out. Just finalizing. We'll find out later. We have one more question. One more question. The last one, one over here. Wow, I'm honored to have it. Thank you. It um, seems to me as you implement the, uh, the standards and the new technologies, two challenges that I'm wondering how you plan to address, which is 
Number one, the installed base, all these dumb devices that have been around for a while, how do they integrate and come into the new networks? But more importantly, as a lot of these inexpensive devices get to be on the IoT networks, it seems to me it places a really big burden on the software, and uh, you know, Patrick, you mentioned that, because you have these cheap devices that may be very inexpensive to build and transmit information, but the software burden that comes onto them to prevent them from being hacked is going to be very significant. And, and how do you plan to address any kind of you know, testing or, or policy change or something to prevent that from happening very easily? Thanks. Who wants to take certification or? Yeah, I think. I'm assuming it's fairly straightforward on the license. There's a lot of global work there. Yeah. When you get into LTE yeah. private, I would say it's still part of that ecosystem. But when it gets a little fuzzy, you get into Wi-Fi, which has a lot of folks looking at it, but then you got a lot of these YouTube. other unlicensed, yeah. maybe proprietary technologies. Yeah. They have to stand on their own merits. Yeah. And obviously the city won't deploy anything until it's been robustly validated and tested, at least by experts that you trust. Yeah. Is there something that you guys want to add as far as what would be done? Like, what's done to prevent that help button from being Nothing. erroneously hacked yeah. and saying, okay, I need help here, but in fact, yeah. it's spoofing the location and some. Yeah. And I mean, I think I, we've else. seen some self regulation. So, for instance, around Mac ID tracking, uh, there's an organization called the Future Privacy Forum in Washington, D.C., that you know, enables people to actually opt out their Mac IDs of being you know, uh, detected. Uh, even Verizon is actually, when you walk into a Verizon store, they're detecting the Mac ID of your phone, and they tell you that. And there's actually a place you can go to. It's called smartplaces.org, and you can essentially opt out your Mac ID. Now, Verizon's opted in, and I believe Ruckus is part of that, too, where they've opted in to not uh, use that Mac ID. But again, it's, this is self-regulation. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, that's the best. The software for behind some of these. Software, things. you know, the, the certification is going to be happening at the chipset level with whatever technology is being deployed. Uh, that, that can happen. I think what we're seeing happen in a lot of these IoT networks is that the intelligence is being pushed to the edge of the network so you can deal with things like GDPR and, and privacy and potentially cybersecurity by having the compute capability in the device. So, you know, yes, it's software, but it's also the chipset that's in the device and, and the cost of those chipset and the compute capability is, is, is increasing while the cost is decreasing. So we're gonna see more and more, again, dumb things are gonna become smart, the beginning of which is being able to identify them and know where they are, but then they're gonna have a lot more capabilities in the future. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and I'll scale issues. with the sensitivity of the product. That's right. Something that's Depending relatively the innate case. sitting there is that's not right. going to be that important as right. something like a truck moving. Exactly. Down. I mean, nobody's going to be able to get into your Fitbit and, and cause you to have a heart attack. Like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> uh, Unless your blood pressure goes through the roof. That's right. Um, so, well, I think we've, oh, we, we've kind of run down. over a little bit. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, the panelists. Awesome job. It was great. And, um, I, I do uh, just want to thank um, Sanjay Agarwal from American Tower for putting this together with Ed. Sanjay. So thank you.